Thank you for joining me. And this week, we're going to be joined by our special guest, Matthew Jensen. He's a pastor out of Atlanta, Georgia, and he's a great brother that I've had some interaction and fellowship with on Facebook. And I've invited him to speak with us about his perspective on some of these topics here. And uh, hi, Matthew. Welcome. Appreciate uh, you for joining me. Yeah, you're more than welcome. I appreciate you for asking me. This is my favorite thing to talk about is the scripture. So thank you so much. All right, Matthew. Just if you're welcome, just to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you know uh, where you came from and and your view of yeah. You know, I guess you want to tell us about the church that you co-pastor or, and okay. Any, okay, anything you'd like to include? Um, I was raised in the Pentecostal church uh, from from birth, so um, come from a family of pastors and uh, musicians and song leaders and all of that. And so probably around, I would say, 1995, 96, right in there, uh, I decided to start reading the Bible for myself, studying the Bible for myself, and came to some different conclusions from what I had been hearing from the pastors in, in my church and in other churches, too, where we would go for camp meetings or tent revivals or things like that. And so that didn't go over too well. Um, uh, thankfully I have, uh, a lot of good family that didn't throw me away. Um, even though I feel like some people did <laughs> when all that <laughs> happened, but, uh, you know, you know, you, you just, you try to love, love people no matter what they do to you. Um, so I got married. I, what started it was I met my, at that time, future wife, and I married her in January of 1998 and started studying the Bible with her dad. And so when I studied the Bible with her dad, I learned about the sacred name and the Sabbath and the dietary laws. That was the that was kind of the big three for me at first in the late 90s. Um, started learning about them before I got married, but then, then after I got married, started learning about that. And uh, so uh, I'll try to make it quick. I started pastoring... Um, as one of the pastors for the congregation here in Georgia, uh, ministers of the New Covenant Fellowship. And I did that from, oh, it's probably been, I want to say 13, 14 years ago is when I started, something like that. And uh, probably shouldn't have at that time. If I had to do over again, I would wait until I got a little bit more age on me and a little bit more experience. I tell people, you know, even, even the Messiah waited till he was 30 years old to start his ministry. <laughs> and uh, the Levites, I think, had to be 35 years old before they started their ministry. So, um, but yeah, so we've got a little small fellowship here um, in the uh, kind of North Georgia area. There's probably, if, if everybody is at a Sabbath service and nobody's sick or out of town, we probably have about 50 to 60 people. And that includes the children as well. And we've had up to as many as, you know, 100, 125 at Sukkot, the fall festival, Festival of Tabernacles. Um, so that's a little bit uh, about me, Sean. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. I think it's a fun um, uh, relationship that you can have with your father-in-law to be able to study scripture with him. He's one of the most righteous men that I've ever met in my life. Uh, he's He'll be 73 this year. And I have great respect uh, for him, um, not just as a father-in-law, but as an elder in the faith. Uh, he has quite a testimony um, about where he came from, uh, but he's been serving the Creator now uh, to any capacity probably for, uh, it's been over 40 years. That's and awesome. So, um, yeah, he kind of came in. I came in, you know, in diapers uh, to, you know, to to Christianity, to the big realm of Christianity. And he came in in his, I think it was in his late twenties, or early thirties, something like that. So, uh, but yeah, it's great. He always picks my brain. We don't always agree on everything, <laughs> but that's good. You know, iron sharpened iron, you know, so. That is good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that we see, even see that in the book of Acts, right? The apostles didn't agree on every single, sure. every single thing, sure. Sure. but they were united in purpose, you know? And uh, they were to reach the people with the word of God, right? With the message. Yes. yes. Uh, and that's what I just feel like I hope to. That's one of my, you know, long-term goals for videos like this, for a series like this, is that um, we may realize that 
break through some of the misconceptions about some of the terms as we define these terms from scriptures and also yeah. just realize some of the, uh, you know, like I said, some of the things that other believers may not agree on at first, but once you sit together and sharpen and look at the word together, you realize we, we weren't that far apart on it, you know? Yeah, that's and right. That's, I agree. Yeah. And that's yeah. the goal. So. You know, you mentioned some of the things about the fall feasts and dietary laws and yes. uh, some of the things that you began studying with your father-in-law. You know, many people would put those into a general word called the Torah. Mm -hmm. And um, because those are mentioned in, you know, the books of Exodus through Numbers, as far as, you know, uh, instructions on how to keep. It's also mentioned in Deuteronomy. Um, and I, it's, it's of my opinion that we actually see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob keeping some of these feasts even before they're introduced. In Genesis, but that's a, a little bit different video, maybe a uh, bigger, longer video that I'll be doing on the covenants uh, later on this channel. But, but yeah, uh, I just think that it's fascinating that, you know, you're brought into, a, you came into church under a certain idea. And then as you began to continue to read the book on your own, which is what we're always encouraged to do, right? Sure. But then when we actually start to do it, <laughs> we run into some things, right? We yeah. run into some questions. Oh, and yeah. so you you and your father-in-law searched out those questions together and uh, you started being instructed in some of the concepts of the Torah. But if I were to use that word Torah in a modern setting, a lot of people, a lot of fellow believers, they may not know what we're talking about. What does the word Torah mean to you, Matthew? Um, it's translated as law in the Old Testament. And I think that's fine. I, you know, some Messianic Hebrew roots, whatever you want to call them, say that law is a bad translation. I don't think that's the case. I think law is good. I think we have a misconception about the word law, but if we wanted to really break it down, I tell people that it's loving guidance and instruction from a good father. Um, I have five children. Okay. My oldest child is 20. My youngest is 10. And I've lived here at this house that I'm at now for about 13 years. So they were a lot younger when we first moved here. And one of the first things that I wanted to do here at the house was put a fence all the way around the three acre property that I had bought. And my wife and I agree that it would be best for our children. And we would tell them as we closed the gate at the entrance, not to go outside of the fence. Um, they didn't understand why they were little, especially the really little ones. But the whole idea of the fence was to protect my children. It wasn't because I had a disdain for my children um, that I didn't love my children. It was the exact opposite. It was because I did love them and I wanted to take care of them. And even though there's not a whole lot of traffic on the road where we live, there is some. And I didn't want to take any chance of them, you know, getting out in the traffic, getting hit by a car, getting injured in any way. Um, I wanted to keep them close to, to mommy and daddy. And um, so I was, I was trying my best to be a loving father and take care of my five children. And I think that that's what Yahweh is doing when he gives us his his Torah, his law, his instructions, his guidance is it's it's loving instructions. It's our father saying, look, this is what is best for you. This is how life will be most prosperous for you. This is how you will be blessed if you obey these instructions. And if you if you veer off and don't obey, there'll be bad things that'll happen. Um, I don't think that the that the Torah is like, keep the Torah and then be blessed. I think that when you keep the Torah, you're automatically blessed because the blessings are embedded within the commandments. And I think the cursings are embedded when you go outside of the commandments. And so you'll be, you'll be uh, more healthy. Uh, your finances will be more in order. Um, your marriage will be better. Uh, your parent to child relationships will be better if you follow the, the good father's loving guidance and instruction. That's that's when I hear the word Torah, think about a good father in heaven that loves his children and wants to protect us. Yeah, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with my experience, at least as far as the, the use of that word from others and how they they know it means the word law, which if you look at all the supplementary de definitions, it'll also like you described, it'll also be the word instructions, you know, and they they know it means that, but at the same time, they don't think that for some reason that 
it, that it applies to modern believers. They kind of think it was just for a certain group of people. Yeah. And that's to me, that's, I agree with you. It's funny since I've never talked to you about this before, but I, I share almost the same definition from my research and study is that it's just God's loving instructions. I think it may be a general admission by, by most men that in order to acknowledge that the father has instructions for us on how to behave requires us to acknowledge that we might not be behaving according to those at this moment. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where the, you know, that's where the little bit of the uh, self-evaluation and a little bit of the humility comes in as far as to even just sure. acknowledge the definition of the word, you know, at least in sure. my experience and talking with others, you know? Um, yeah. And I think I love that. I love the way you put it and how you describe it because, um, you know, I believe it's in Hebrews 12, right? where uh, the writer of Hebrews is actually um, quoting some uh, a prophet from the Old Testament in verse 5, and he says, And have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you're reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Yes. You know, and I and I just think that it's, it's a fascinating concept um, to acknowledge him as a father, for one, you know, and, and then, of course, the natural thought that we would lead to at that point is every father has guidance for their children. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. And that's just that's the most amazing part. And but Matthew, do you believe that the word Torah and those instructions are applicable for believers today? Absolutely. Yeah, that was that was one of the things that when I began to study the Bible for myself, that was one of the easiest things for me to see. And, and you've got to realize, I mean, I come from a family where, you know, my grandparents and my great grandparents here in the southeastern United States, what they call the Bible Belt. So they would never argue against like the Ten Commandments. Now, they might they might waffle a little bit on number four. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But. You know, my my great grandmother uh, and great grandfather, they they would they would have kept Sunday as as the Sabbath. You know, I don't believe Sunday is the Sabbath, but they would have kept Sunday as the Sabbath. So everything would shut down around here and they would go to church and they would go home. And they would take a nap and take it easy and rest on, on Sunday. And so if you if you understand their perspective on that, then they're they're fully on board on the Ten Commandments. And so I came from. Um, that type of a of a, of a childhood that we're supposed to obey the Lord's commandments. And so it wasn't difficult for me when I started reading the Bible. I came across certain commandments that I was not obeying. And to me, and I still say this today, if anybody is reading the Bible and you come across a commandment that you have the ability to obey, then you should obey it. Obviously, there's some in there that you don't have the ability to obey. Not, not everybody that lived back then had the ability to obey every single commandment. But if you see one that you're not doing and, and, and it, you know, it's right there and you're reading the scriptures and it's, it's a law or an instruction, whether you understand it or not, the father, once again, he's a good father. He loves his children. He's told you to do something for your good, for your benefit. So you are to obey it. So, I mean, from from Genesis, we see, I think it's Genesis 26 uh, verses one through five, where Yahweh is making a promise to Isaac. And he tells Isaac that this is going to be a blessing to you because your dad, Abraham, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Uh, we see as far back as uh, Genesis chapter four, we're able somehow knew to offer up the firstborn of his flock and not just the that but and the fat portions thereof it says and which is a strict specific instruction later on in leviticus right very very strict and more detailed as we read in leviticus but yeah. i think it's the same thing what what's commanded in detail in leviticus is is what's happening in genesis chapter four so yeah. you know i believe that yahweh my belief is that yahweh taught his instructions uh to to Adam and then Adam in turn taught them to his son and then his son in turn taught them which would be Seth after Abel died Seth would teach them to his son and so forth and so on and you, if you read the book of Jasher which is a one of those extra biblical books 
as they as people call it, extra biblical books. It's mentioned twice in the the canon of 66, the American canon of 66. Jasher's mentioned twice, but it talks about how that there were men like Enoch and and Shem. And people would go to these men and they would learn the Torah. They would learn the instructions of Yahweh by going to these elders. Uh, and so, yeah, I definitely believe the commandments are for us today. Well, let, let me throw a New Testament verse out there because people like to hear the New Testament. <laughs> All right. First John chapter five, verse three. Um, it says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous or burdensome. So that's the biblical definition of love is to keep the father's commandments. He's given us commandments, not suggestions. He's given us commandments. When we keep them, and we do have the ability to, to keep them, when we keep them, it is us showing love towards the creator and towards our, our neighbor. There's, there is no other way to show love except by keeping Yahweh's commandments. So I absolutely am on board with keeping any commandment that you have the ability to obey. Now, many times I'll have this conversation with folks and, and sometimes people will say, well, it's impossible for us to keep them. And then and then they have a variety of reasons they think that. Sometimes they even quote a couple verses um, according to their understanding of that verse, uh, what they what would lead them to that conclusion, what would make them think that it's impossible to keep them. And to which, you know, in my, my personal studies, I, I've had to lovingly reply to them, well, yes, it's impossible for me to keep the instructions on um, that apply to kings because I'm not a king. You know, it's, it's impossible for me to keep the instructions that apply to a farmer's field since I'm not a farmer and I don't own a field. <laughs> yeah. But in the future, I plan to own a field and I plan to do some farming. And then suddenly I'll have some new instructions to abide by. You know, um, it's just, and this is the part where people think um, there are some, there are some verses that we'll, we'll be tackling in this series here in the Torah apologetics um, that people have taken to, to bolster which, which uh, is my opinion is a false conclusion, but they'll use some verses to bolster this false conclusion that it's impossible to keep God's instructions to mankind. Yeah. And, and I just, it, I used to believe that myself because I had fallen to a specific doctrinal framework that was introduced to me and taught to me. And that is called dispensation theology. And yeah. that is, um, and that's something that I had to, to, I grew out of because I continued to read that book. Like we said, right? I just read sure. it on my own and myself sure. and I saw there's some issues here. If you think that the commandments are too difficult or impossible to obey, Deuteronomy 30, 11, we don't even have to comment on it, Sean, but I just want to read it. That's fine. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. And don't forget, I tell people all the time that when they read the Bible, they need to follow the 2020 rule. 2020 biblical vision. And what I mean by that is make sure anytime a preacher tells you to read a verse, you read at least 20 verses before it and 20 verses after it. <laughs> it's good advice. Deuteronomy 30 verse 11. This command that I give you today is certainly not too difficult or beyond your reach. Just because we have broken the commandments, and I have, I've broken mul multitude of times, I've broken commandments, does not mean that they're too difficult to keep. In the times that I've broken the commandments or that anybody has, what you've done is you've chosen the flesh over the spirit. You've chosen the, the wrong way over the right way. So it doesn't have anything to do with the difficulty level. It's simply because you chose to do what was wrong. Would it be faulty logic for me to say, if you can keep that that instruction, whatever that particular commandment is that you broke, if you can keep it just once, then you can keep it twice and yes. you can keep it a third time. And you, yes. you know what I mean? Yes. So that to me, that was another kind of in, very encouraging, inspiring revelation that I had coming to study this topic was that yes. when people would say, well, you know, you can't keep them, you're going to break them. I'm like, absolutely. And then I realized, cause I had studied the book more. I realized that's why we have, a high priest in Yeshua who receives our confession, yeah. just like the Levites were to receive the confession of those in Israel back in the day. Amen. And that was, there was already an anticipation that we wouldn't keep them perfectly. That was the whole point of having a mediator in the priesthood so that they could represent us and, and we could do the atonement process. Um, agree. 
like it, that was that entire every time you see the word priest used and i haven't really counted personally matthew but i'm sure it's in there a lot but every time you see the word priest or any instruction relating to the priest and their duties that whole point of all that the context of all that is the idea that god knows you're going to mess up from time to time sure yeah i tell people um Im embedded within the law of yahweh is the sacrificial system that that gracious merciful loving sacrificial system that yahweh gave whereby the israelites could receive the forgiveness of their sins read leviticus chapter 16 about the day of atonement so yahweh sure we know that when we read about yeshua there's four or five passages that says he didn't sin he was perfect things like that but yahweh automatically knew that sean and matthew and and, and the others many others all others <laughs> minus minus yeshua would fall short of absolute perfection and therefore he placed within the torah a remedy for sin so yahweh is not yahweh is not demanding perfection what he's demanding is covenant faithfulness and loyalty whereby when you fall you participate in the means that he has given for the forgiveness of your sins which obviously i mean you just mentioned it is, is yeshua our our high priest now in the heavens yeah um, he is it first john one nine yes yes that we confess our sins he's faithful and just to cleanse yes. us of all unrighteousness. Yes, Absolutely. and that's and and the whole the whole point of that verse is to explain what is mentioned to us all through the book of Hebrews, which is that he became a high priest. Yes, that yes. was the the prophecy for him in the yes. Old Testament. So yeah, I think that's fascinating. But but you know, as I mentioned earlier about some of these arguments, you do hear against the idea of is it possible to keep these instructions in your life? What are what's a common argument you may have heard amongst modern day disciples of Jesus that say that it's impossible to keep this Torah or this law of God. Oh man, Sean. Wow. I've heard so <laughs> many. I've heard so many. Of <laughs> Just funnel it down to one or two, maybe. <laughs> well, let me, let me kind of, let me kind of give a, a, a big one and not, not just one verse, but a concept. And I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds here, but it's this whole, it's this, it's this whole uh, Pauline primacy concept. As though whenever you get into a discussion about obedience to the Torah with a mainstream Christian, without a doubt, guaranteed, the first verse they're going to quote is something out of the writings of the Apostle Paul. And I believe that Paul is a genuine apostle born out of due season. I have no problem with the writings of Paul. I don't believe he's false in any sense of the word. Um, I don't think he's infallible. And I think sometimes he shared his opinion with us and it wasn't inspired. But um, it's like they, they have a Pauline primacy. So, in, in other words, nothing else in the scriptures really matters. Let me quote you this verse, this one liner or two liner from from Paul. And so I think that we need to challenge as as Torah observant Christians, we need to challenge that paradigm. And instead of or, or put it like this, when somebody says, well, what about this verse in Ephesians or what about this verse in Galatians? Galatians is real popular with with uh, anti the antinomian or anti Torah crowd. We should say, well, what about this verse in Deuteronomy? <laughs> what about this verse in Leviticus? You know, and then maybe they'll look at us, you know, with an eyebrow raised. And we 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 begin to talk about uh, what I like to call the Yahweh primacy or you could call it the Torah primacy. But. You know, it's like we we put on the back burner what Yahweh, our father and our creator have said and say, look what the apostle Paul said when Paul is an apostle of Yeshua and Yeshua, according to Hebrews three, verse one, is the apostle of Yahweh. He's the apostle and high priest of our confession. So it all ultimately goes back to father Yahweh. And so that's probably the most common one. The paradigm is. You know, let me quote a verse from Paul and disregard everything else that scripture has to say. And I think that is a I think that's a bad paradigm. I think it needs to be challenged and people need people's minds need to be retrained not to ne not to negate or neglect Paul, not to do that. Please don't misunderstand me. Anybody that's watching not to ne negate or neglect Paul. I've been I've been teaching through the book of Galatians. I, I've taken a break, but I've taught 30 
I think it's 39 sermons on the first three chapters of Galatians. OK, so I love the writings of Paul. I have no problem with them, but they're not my foundation. Um, my foundation is Yeshua is the cornerstone Yahweh laid. And then on top of that comes the prophets and then the apostles, mainly the, the primary apostles, the ones uh, whose names will be written on the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. And then the one born out of due season, the, the apostle Paul. Um, you know, so I, I think, think a lot of believers that makes don't, sense. It makes perfect sense. You, you worded it well. And, and to add to what you're saying, I, I've run into that same Paul primacy that you're talking about, that same disposition you see, because it is not only uh, shared amongst many churches, but it's actually taught in seminaries. Mm -hmm. And that and that is a, definitely needs to be challenged, like you said, because that is something where you get a man in a position of authority and you get a man in a position of leadership and he sometimes doesn't want to be questioned, you know. <laughs> and and I say that in the most loving way, but that's just the reality of life. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a, ma a minister or not or a CEO of a business. Sometimes people are used to not being questioned. And so then when someone comes along to say, well, well what about this? They don't want to take the time to answer you, nor nor do they want to treat you with the same respect as if you had agreed with them already. So mm -hmm. this definitely is uh, one of the motivating reasons for this particular show is the Paul primacy that you're referring to, this idea mm -hmm. of people that are putting Paul first. And, and in addition to these interviews, I'll also be doing with each episode an actual apologetic um, on the concept of Torah all throughout the scriptures. And much of that is going to be addressing some of these big common misconceptions from Paul's writings. So... Um, I don't know if I'll get up to 39 on the first three chapters of Galatians, <laughs> but uh, that's pretty impressive. But at the same time, yeah, I share your passion because I've, that's what I saw for so long was that Paul never taught new doctrine. He couldn't. He could only espouse what the Messiah taught and the other disciples knew, understood, and taught. Paul is literally commentary on the, on the actual law and prophets, and sure. people don't realize that. You're, that he is, you know, people want to go to the commentary of famous theologians and preachers throughout history. But I'm sitting here going, hey, the disciples, including Paul, they're, they're the best commentary you can get on the law and the prophets. Yeah. Like they're the, they're the first hand, first, first generation commentary, you sure. know. And so, yeah, none of them had new doctrine because it's everything that they said is only quoting and explaining the Old Testament. Sure. Um, which is why the more I've studied Genesis to Deuteronomy, I found out that. Even the prophets themselves and much of the prophecy. Now, there's some elaboration within prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel and things like that. But mm -hmm. the core of what they're talking about has already been explained in Genesis through Deuteronomy. Yeah, because there's there's prophecies built into the instructions and, and the history. And so um, it's just a book that is what I would call a cumulative. Right. Yeah, sure. Genesis through Deuteronomy introduces lots of ideas and lots yeah. of concepts both history and future prophecy and instruction from start to finish. And then as these prophets and history books come later, and then the epistle writings, all of it is just cumulatively building on yeah. what was already introduced at the very beginning of the book. Yeah. Um, and so that's, they're just doing nothing but expounding further and further on what was already first introduced. And Paul is no different at all. He did not, in my, in my humble opinion, he did not teach any new doctrine, um, but he's, he just masterfully, <laughs> try to explain and here's here's the thing is that i jokingly have told people in the past that are new in the faith you know they want to ask me questions about galatians or ephesians um or second corinthians and i'll just tell them hey if you you're you're going to a phd a phd's commentary on the law and the prophets and he's using Little words and taken for granted, you understand concepts already, which is why even in like Romans chapter seven, verse one, he starts the sentence saying, I'm speaking to those who know the law. Right. Yeah. So he's already coming at it from a place of mastery of yeah. the content of the material. And if you don't know the material that he's commenting on and talking about and explaining to you, yeah. or trying to explain to you, then, of course, you're going to come to a wrong conclusion. Yes. Because you haven't taken the time to actually study the source material yourself as Paul had. So that's sure. that's where I always try to say, look, I 100 percent agree with you. Paul is definitely an apostle. Um, his writings are you know, valid. Uh, I don't discount him at all. I think he's, you know, deserves to be in the book. I just feel bad for him because he's so misrepresented. <laughs> he's just <laughs> he's, turning over in Sheol. He's, he's got he has such wisdom. I, you, you find out more about an author when you spend loads of time in an epistle 
And that's what's happened to me in Galatians. I'm looking forward to teaching on chapters four, five, and six later this year, Yah's will. But when I was going through chapter three, I discovered an extremely complex argument from the Apostle Paul that I'd never seen before because I just hadn't spent as much time as I am now going through it. And it, it has to do with Abraham. Um, this is when he's dealing with the circumcision party in Galatians 3. He heavily bases his argument on Father Abraham. And um, it's fascinating. I don't want to get off track, but uh, I love the writings of Paul. I just don't I don't think that that's where we should start. I think we should start yeah. with uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy and then build from there. Well, as, as my wife says um, in some of our videos of our Bible studies, she says, I was raised to read a book from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as we mentioned, though, because people sometimes object or protest because they've been taught this line of thinking um, that these instructions from God, this this thing called Torah um, mm -hmm. is not applicable for us today. That's that's the claim that, that we're discussing it kind of leads me to think, well, where did those instructions come from? Right. And that's a kind of a little bit of the groundwork I want to lay for folks if possible. So okay. if I could, um, you know, the, we call it the law of God, right? Right. People, people will make statements like, well, we're not under the law. Well, okay, well, let's just, let's back up and let's look at that term a little bit. The law of God. The word God is a very generic English term that sometimes is translated as L in Hebrew or Elohim as in a plural form. Sometimes even Elohim is used in a singular form in the Hebrew. But at the same time, we also have in um, Exodus chapter 3, the quote-unquote God, the Almighty, the Creator, speaking to Moses, said, by the way, here's my name. I didn't reveal it to Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob or anyone before you, but they all just call me the Almighty. But by the way, here's my name. You know what I mean? And so uh, what a privilege to Moses in, in one regard. But at the same time, you know, we're not getting... We're getting, I, I feel like it helps personalize some ideas. You know, when we actually got somebody's name, you yes. know, so this isn't just the law of God, the generic big God who, who knows what that picture strikes in your head when I say that. But when I say the word Yahweh, which is the name he introduced to us now, and without getting into a full on debate about pronunciations, um, I, I just, there's, it's commonly referred to as four Hebrew letters, the yod heh vav -Heh. Right. Um, and how we pronounce in the English is, is highly debated, but I, I hope that doesn't become the point of discussion in the comment section of this video, because that's then you would miss the rest of the video, right? Sure. So the, the Yohei de Vahe was the was the four letters he revealed as his name to Moses. Um, who who is that to you in Scripture, Matthew? Uh, that is the Creator, um, known as the Creator, the Almighty, the Ancient of Days, um, the Father. Uh, the one that Yeshua prayed to, um, the one that all the prophets, when they said, thus saith Yahweh, if you're reading the KJV, thus saith the Lord in all caps. Uh, that's that's who that is. That's the one that I serve. Um, that's the one that Yeshua served. Um, uh, so, and I, I think it's important that we use his name. Like you said, I mean, to a Philistine, if you said, you know, I worship El or Elohim, that's that's generic to a Philistine. Dagon could be called Elohim. Um, but all of the all of the heathen deities, they had proper names. And so when you said Yah, the short form or Yahweh um, or however it was pronounced back then, I don't think anybody knows with 100 percent certainty. But when you when you use the Tetragrammaton, uh, the four letters, uh, it distinguished the mighty one of Israel from Ashtoreth and Nibhaz and Tartak and Adramalek and all of them. And I think it is a shame, you know, I think it's a shame that all of these, all these heathen deities, their names get transliterated in our Bibles. <laughs> but the name of the one who authored the scriptures usually is hidden behind titles. Um, so it does personalize things. Uh, that's one of the ways that I start out my conversations when, when somebody listens to me for a little bit talk or maybe sees how I'm dressed or something like that and knows this guy is not, you know, the same as most people that I've met. <laughs> they say, well, you know, what's your faith? And I'll tell them, um, I, I worship and serve the creator Yahweh. And they're like Yahweh. And then, you know, boom, just one thing leads to another. It snowballs. And so, yeah, Yahweh is the creator. He is the father. He is the one that I serve. The, the one true uh, John 17, 3, Yeshua says he's the only true God or the only true mighty one.
Yeah. I, amen. Absolutely. That's yeah. something I always try to remind folks is, is when Jesus told us how to pray, he yes. said, pray in this way, our yeah. father. Right. And I think it's interesting. He uses the, the word, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Right. Yeah. Our father. So Jesus is lumping himself into that, that pronoun, our father. Yes. Um, but yeah, and that's, and as you said, John 17, three, John 10, there's, there's so many places. Uh, where Yeshua refers to the Father, obviously the baptism itself, the voice out of heaven, this is my son, <laughs> which implies I'm his father, right? So it's just, it's interesting. Um, we, yeah. But that's definitely a different video going into full on to that conversation. Yeah. But yeah, to, so the reason I asked that is because many times I've heard this term, the law of God used, and and people do not understand which God is being referred to in scripture. So thank you. You, you did a great job kind of laying that out. Um, and I totally agree with you. You know, it's... It, why? Why have they just given a title to us in many of these translations when all these other deities that are considered false gods get a get an actual name? Yeah. You know, it's kind of it's kind of strange. Yeah. Um, and, and I just wonder, you know, well, it, it just seems strange to me, you know, and so um, I think it is. It is important to know the actual name and because he even tells Moses, by the way, tell Pharaoh, this is my name. This yeah. is the this is the one who's telling you to do to let my children go. And then Pharaoh, what does he do, right? He says, I don't know. He looks in the books, right? I don't know this guy. <laughs> Who's this guy? Because they had so many they worshipped. You know what I mean? Sure. The, the you, you, alluded, you alluded to um, Exodus 3, 14 through 15 earlier. And a point that I like to point out to people on Exodus three fifteen is he says, this is my name forever. This is the King James Version says, this is my memorial to all generations. Um, basically. If you look at different translations there, or the Hebrew or the Greek Septuagint, what he's saying is, this is how I want you to remember me. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason. And it's because the yod Hey wav Hey or the, the Yahweh there means, it has a meaning. And it means self-existent. I cause everything to be. I, I am the designer. I have no beginning. I have no end. Everything that you see, I, I caused that to come into existence. So every time we say Yahweh, we're we're pronouncing him as the self-existent one who causes everything else to happen. That is so powerful. And we miss that when we, you know, just use God or even the Hebrew Elohim. That, the word Elohim doesn't mean self-existent one that causes to be, you know, That's uh, right. nor, nor does Adonai. So uh, I, I do think it's important. I don't, you know, we have people in our congregation that pronounce it differently and we, I don't make a big deal about that. I, I think it's just important that we recognize he does have a name. It's not Lord. It's not God. Um, and, and we should do our very best as children uh, to call upon it. And I think that if we mispronounce it, he'll correct us in the future. And we'll say, yes, Master, we'll call you by the proper pronunciation. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say? Is it Zephaniah 3.9 that I'll restore to my people a pure speech and lip? Yes, I think I, I think I said that slightly off, but general yes. idea. Beautiful um, Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just think it's fascinating because you know I love ancient history, and if you look at the Egyptians to whom this message was being given, right, that the name's being introduced so that Pharaoh could hear it from Moses's mouth. I think sure. it's interesting because they worshipped the pantheon of gods, families of gods, and within that structure of that pantheon of gods, there was the top one, which was Ra. Sure. And then you had Osiris and all the other families of gods built up too. So it was, a, it was literally a pyramid structure of, you know, authority structure. Ra was at the top. So Moses came, comes in saying a name that is not Ra, you know, <laughs> yeah. and that, that, that would be alarming, right? That would get your attention. And it did, it got his attention. So um, yeah, it's fascinating that, you know, just trying to remind folks that when we're talking about these instructions, it's not just from anybody and it's not for men and it's not, and it's not what Moses made up. I've actually heard people say, well, this is just the writings of Moses. This was just the quote unquote law of Moses. And I know that term is used from time to time in the New Testament, sure. but Moses didn't originate these ideas. No. He, he didn't get up there on Mount Sinai and just make up some instructions because these were just being reaffirmed on Mount Sinai. These instructions, as we've already talked about, sure. were already given to mankind since creation. Because, you know, Matthew, with the way I playfully like to put this idea is that if you're, these are instructions for living. Yeah, right? because what does he tell us? If you do these, you will live. Yeah, right. So if you're alive, here's your handbook. You know, 
It's that yeah. simple. Yeah. I was reading the passage. I was meditating on a passage today. And you know the passage. It's in Proverbs 3. And it talks about uh, keep the commandments. Keep my law. And it says uh, they shall be like as chains or a garland around your neck. And write them on the tab- tables of your heart. They'll bring you prosperity and health and success. And it says it mentions that they will be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Now, health to your navel, that automatically should make our minds go to when a baby is born and the umbilical cord is attached to the navel and you have actually another brain in your stomach. That's that's your second brain, your digestive system that causes your moods and how you act. And, and you know, depending on what you eat, if you eat healthy or you don't eat healthy. And then the marrow to your bones, that, that, that has to do with blood cells. The life is in the blood. I mean, this is the Torah. Health to your navel, marrow to your bones. Why in the world would we want to get rid of something like that? Doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> well, I mean, that's you're exactly right. Yeah, it's it is life to us physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, because yeah. it is. You know, it, it, I always try to put it like this. You know, you if you were an engineer and you design a car, and then suddenly you just get in the car and you you. You know, you don't put the key in the ignition to turn it on and you're and you're mad because it's not taking you where you want to go. Hmm. Well, you're not using it right. You know, so we've been given a body. We've been given a soul. We've been given a spirit. We're put we're put in this existence. And he told us this is how you use it. You know, and if you don't, you're going to get all these bad things that are going to start going wrong. And you're going to be disappointed and hurt and uh, disillusioned with life and depression will come and sadness and mourning. But it's health to your bones if these instructions are followed. So. Here's a fun question, though. Were the followers of the law of God within the nation of Israel themselves? Uh, are they equal to modern believers who follow Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah? You know, then you know, the son of God. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's any difference. I don't I don't think that there's um, two different salvation methods or ways of salvation. I think you alluded to it when you talked about your former belief in dispensational theology. I think that that's whack. (laughs) I think that everybody that has ever been saved or had their sins forgiven, um, got in the race, has been saved by grace, through faith, with works. And I think that people in the old covenant looked forward to the coming Messiah, to the promised Messiah. People that lived during his lifetime had him there tangible and then we now with faith we look back even though we haven't seen him we haven't touched him hugged him we look back with faith similar to how the ones prior to him looked forward with faith so yes absolutely somebody like abraham or enoch or moses or joshua um you could call them a christian (laughs) and i know a lot of you know a lot of messianic people don't like that term but just means follower of christ follower of of the messiah if you prefer messiah follower of the anointed one we want to translate it into english the anointed one they were followers of the anointed one even though he wasn't you know walking around on the scene like he was in matthew mark luke and john's record um, he's not walking around on the scene right now but we're followers of the messiah we follow his example we follow what he did so I don't think that there's any difference, brother. I, I think that Abraham and Paul share the same faith. They share the same belief system. I agree with you. In fact, there's a there's the writer of Hebrews would agree with you too. I think it's in chapter 11, verse 39. Uh, it says that all of these, and I love how it, it, it lumps them all in, right? Because the previous 38 verses was mentioning all these guys you're mentioning, right? All the way back from yes. Adam to Enoch to Noah. Yes. To Jacob, Rebecca, Samson, David, Solomon, these people like that. Um, it was saying that all of these, as it gave you a little brief history of some of their accolades or some of their moments where they impl- they use their faith and, and to actually go and be obedient to the Father. Yes. Because they knew something greater was coming, that there was going to be a reward for their obedience and their faith. And, that, um, and that's why verse 39 starts out saying all of these guys gained sure. their approval through their faith. Yes. Um, They did not receive what was promised to them. Right. Because God had provided something better for all of us 
so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. And so we're all made perfect together at the resurrection. Yes. You yes. Know? And that's, so it's like, you know, this kind of goes into the semantics, I guess you'd say of the concept of salvation itself, you know, is, are you literally saved at this instant? What does salvation mean according to scripture? Right. But um, obviously there's a change of heart, a change of disposition when the spirit sure. dwells sure. in you through your faith and confession of Christ. Uh, not only that he exists, but that he came to live, die, and be resurrected for you to become your high priest. We all acknowledge that idea, right? There's a moment of conversion is what we generally call that, where we step into the sanctification process and discipleship. Sure. But the, but the, the concept of, uh, that the writer of Hebrews is, is referring to is this idea of them having gained their approval to God through their faith and their actions of faith. But he's reminding us that to the reader at that time, the, the readers obviously would be people that, are alive during the days that he's writing this, meaning all these people that he's mentioning from the past are dead. Yeah. So he's saying that those people that are, that have passed on, you know, that were faithful and righteous. And then you who are reading this, all of us together will be made perfect together at the resurrection. And so this is, um, which is why he even mentions the resurrection in verse 35. But I, th I think that it's fascinating when you really jump into this idea of just understanding, like, you know, people say, well, I've, you know, I don't, that was for them back then. I, I'm saved through Jesus. Well, I'm like, well, what, well, even the New Testament tells us that we're all, quote unquote, saved at the same time. Yeah. And that is this moment at the resurrection where our souls are raised from Sheol, you know, and we're given new incorruptible bodies, as uh, 1 Corinthians 15 explains to us and Jesus explains to us in Luke 20. And uh, so there's just, there's some unique concepts um, that I think deserve some definitions from Scripture that might help us weed through some of these false arguments to understand these ideas. Um, quick question. Do you believe Jesus taught us a new way to obey and worship the Father before he ascended to heaven? No, no, I don't. I think that he came. I think that a lot of the things that Yeshua taught um, had been forgotten or maybe had been um, twisted and thwarted. Um, and I think that's why a lot of the, the groups like Fer the Pharisees, the Sadducees and different groups during his time didn't like him was because he was um, a revolutionary in the sense, not of bringing brand new teaching, but maybe making, bringing something fresh that had been forgotten or twisted or, added to or taken away from. I think this is what is going on in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five. He is comparing his way of life, his his walk, his interpretation of the Torah with the interpretation of the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, you have heard that it has been said means this is the way the scribes and the Pharisees have interpreted this this text. But I say unto you, this is the true interpretation. Let me let me show you what the Torah really means. So I don't think that he, he came to teach a new faith or a new religion, but I do think that he he came to correct some uh, perversions of Yahweh's original instructions. Yeah, we you know, and those same guys that he was trying to correct, he called them uh, what bad shepherds and brood of vipers, yeah, blind <laughs> teachers. Yes, Matthew 23. So, yes. Yeah, he had some very stern words for them. And they, of course, killed him for it. But yes. um, that, you know, that's their reaction to him. And, and they're instead of taking discipline, as you read from Hebrews 12, yeah. towards correction, towards the father's words, they chose the other route. You know, they, they fulfilled the parable of Mark 12, right? Mm -hmm. The, the yeah. vineyard's owner sent his son. Yes. And they, they ignored that. So, yeah. Um, it's sad, it's tragic, but obviously it was intended, it was destined, prophesied, which leads him to becoming our mediator and high priest. So we, um, sure. and being a great example for us of the first resurrection to come. Sure. But, you know, another thing that I think about is, um, is just, we were used the Hebrew word Torah already, right? And we, we understand now it's just, it's a Hebrew word called Torah, it just means law or instructions or commandment. We also get this idea that it's, you know, that is uh, is wrapped into the, the term that's so often used in a derogatory way by many believers when they talk about the quote unquote law of God. Mm -hmm. And there's another Hebrew term that many people have been using and many, many believers who are coming to an understanding of Torah. 
and they're they're starting to call instead of calling him Jesus Christ, they're calling him Yeshua. Uh, yeah. Yeshua Hamashiach, right? It's just the Hebrew word for meaning Jesus Christ. It's right. Yeshua the Messiah. Um, yeah. I just I for me, what I found really helpful in my discourse and my discussions with folks is when I just refer to him as Yeshua of Nazareth. Yes. Because that way it just it there was a reason, in my opinion, that that term was even given to him in the in the the gospels and the epistles because it was a great way to distinguish him from any other yeshua because that name was a was a regularly used hebrew name in that time sure. you know, we see yeshua in the book of ezra and nehemiah right here sure. he was uh, the high priest in that day and so um i think it's interesting to to say this word yeshua because to me it definitely not only does, does the hebrew meaning of it mean salvation which i think is wonderful and if you would break down the letters it means even something a little more special which is really fun Hmm. But, but also it helps distinguish a difference. It, it definitely helps distinguish, you know, because people will say, well, you know, Jesus is our God, right? We're going to worship Jesus as God. And that's a, another big conversation we have. But when you say Yeshua, who is the son of God, again, you're, you're putting a personalization to it that, um, that sometimes may yeah. people to think a little bit, you know? Sure. Yeah. People ask me, why do you, why do you call Jesus Yeshua? And I, I, I always kind of started with a joke kind of i said well that's what his mother called him <laughs> so, that's exactly I mean, right yeah. you know, if she called him that why, why not me um you know yeshua of nazareth uh christ he wasn't he wasn't american um he wasn't british you know like you see all these movies and they've got this jesus of nazareth this guy playing jesus of nazareth and it seems like they always have an english accent a british accent <laughs> i saw one the other day where noah had an irish accent you know oh man so yeah. um but yeah so his name that's what his name was his name was was yeshua yod sheen wa ayan i believe it's spelt in in hebrew or in aramaic he, he probably spoke aramaic so he our savior the one that was sent to be the savior of the world, the Messiah, the son of Yahweh, he was, um, he was a Judahite, a Yehudim, Jewish. Um, he wore a robe. Um, he wore sandals, had a beard. Did he practice Judaism? He practiced the faith of the people of Judah. He didn't practice Judaism in the sense of, um, uh, Talmudic Phariseeism, put it that way. That's right. Um, but he he you know, he practiced Torah. So, uh, but our, I, I, people have people have it in their minds this Vidal Sassoon Jesus, you know, this long <laughs> flowing hair, and he's just got this perfect, beautiful skin, and and I just I, I just think that that's uh, that's wrong. There's even one one concept there. Everybody's heard the story of Zacchaeus, where it talked about how that he he climbed the sycamore tree. And it mentions in that text that uh, um, he was short and the he was short could be talking about Zacchaeus, but it could be talking about Yeshua. It's kind of ambiguous there in the Greek. It could be that Yeshua was short and the crowd was covering him. And that's why Zacchaeus climbed. So y Yeshua, the person that's called Jesus, I don't think that he looked like the paintings or the pictures that we see. Um so one of the, one of the things is he was never called he was never called Jesus. The name Jesus is what five hundred years old, maybe max. Yeah, uh, it's an it's an English transliteration of a Greek transliteration of a Hebrew Aramaic name. And it, anytime we transliterate from one language to the next, where we bring the letters from one language to the corresponding letters of another language, we lose a little bit, you know, and so. I tell people you already use the name Yeshua when you say Joshua. That's right. Jo Joshua would be uh, kind of like a, an, a, a better English derivative or an e English derivative from the Hebrew or the Aramaic. So if we can say Joshua, Josh talking about Joshua, the son of Nun, why can't we say Joshua of Nazareth or Jeshua of, of Nazareth? So um, I don't, I'm not saying that to belittle people that use the name Jesus. Sure. Um, I'm not saying that at all. I just think where much is given, much is required. I think once we come to the knowledge, you know, it's like you, Sean. If I called you, even even uh, as we're talking, if I kept calling you Shane, uh, you would probably say, hey, Matthew, by the way, you may have misunderstood me, but my name's Sean, not Shane, right? <laughs> and if I'm respectful of you as a human being, I would say, I'm sorry, Sean. 
I, I, I must have heard you wrong. And then I begin to call you by your given name. Well, our Messiah has a given name. I think it's respectful that we use it. So on, on that particular topic, because this, this comes up a lot um, from people that may take this idea of Torah and put it into a vein of antagonism towards uh -huh. those who have yet to, under, to, to understand or study this idea out. But when you came to the faith 20 years ago, almost 20 years right. ago, right? Did you, did you come to the faith and say that you confess Yeshua as your Lord and Savior, Son of God? Or did you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because that was what you were told and knew. When I was a child, that's all I knew. I, I, I called upon I called upon Jesus. I, I, I believe that Jesus was was the Almighty back then. But but yeah, I, I, I used Jesus and I definitely had a relationship with with the Heavenly Father. Um, it was I believe it was a misguided one. I believe it was, you know, it had a lot of kinks in it. But what does the psalm say? A broken heart and a contract spirit. He will in no wise turn away. Um, I was reading the Bible that was given to me and, and doing the best that I that I knew how to do. And um, I believe the father loved me back then. I do. I, I believe I had a relationship with him and it's just grown. I, I tell people I'm in the same school. I'm just in another grade. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and that's that's kind of the fruit is the evidence of your discipleship and your growth is that yeah. um, it, it wasn't it wasn't depending upon you using his Hebrew name in order to grow sure. in discipleship. Sure. It was, and that wasn't the catalyst for your faith. It was the spirit moving upon you, the kindness yeah. of God that brought you to repentance. Uh, yeah. Same for me, right? Same for me. I come into the faith. I'm calling on the name of Jesus, right? Romans 10, 9, right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking at this idea of, you know, he is the one that I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart. And therefore I consider myself saved in this idea. And, and it's, I had no clue about Hebrew, you know, no. for years. No. For years. Yeah, but there was evidence and fruit and growth in my life all the while. And so this is something that I hope a lot of people, if anyone's watching this and you're, you're testing this idea out, right? Are God's instructions that we are introduced in the Old Testament, are they applicable to disciples of Yeshua today as new, quote unquote, New Testament believers in the modern age? Um, just because other groups may use the idea of Hebrew names should not hopefully it doesn't deter you from researching what's applicable to you as far as what god calls obedience sure. you know and that's sure. just something that i hope to to kind of at least get out there in some regard during this conversation just to hope to encourage folks that look you know you're you call on the name of jesus you you're the father still received you your faith and obedience he still received you just like he did all of us right in yeah. fact there, there's something what we're talking about here is this realization um you know, before we before we started filming, you'd mentioned that you'd recently started studying some of the apocryphal books and some of the books that weren't even put fully into the scriptures in our American, American canon, but books that are in other canons around the world, other Bibles around the world. Um, and one of those books is Jubilees. And yeah. that book, Jubilee, there's actually a prophecy in that book yes. about what, in my opinion, what we're experiencing today. It's in chapter six. And this, this is a parallel prophecy that lines up with Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 3, where basically it is us calling to mind his instructions for us, his mm -hmm. words for us, his commandments for us, right? All the places that we've been scattered across the world, all the believers in the end days will call to mind his instructions. And this is, um, this is, this is a powerful prophecy, right? This is something that... I think that we're experiencing in our modern church churches today because people are are really they're they're curious because they're like wait a minute i'm already following nine out of ten of these commandments my yeah. pastor tells me i can't kill people and i can't lie to people and i you know what i mean yeah. but yet at the same time he tells me that that's i'm not under the law and that i don't need that stuff and there's i think there's a there's kind of a sadly there's a false equivocation to obedience equaling you know, not only do you have to do it perfectly, but you, you, if you don't do it perfectly, you can't be saved. There's like this weird false equivocation that's brought up about this idea, which is why I'm glad you, you kind of explained on some of those issues earlier. But this idea that um, it was always prophesied that we would forget his instructions, his commands in these lands that we were scattered, but then we would remember them later. So that, that doesn't mean we weren't his children in the meantime. To me, so this is my personal opinion, Matthew, but to me, this is why I feel like Jesus even took the time to mention in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, where he says, there will be some in, in heaven who will be called great 
because they taught the commandments. They kept the commandments and taught others to do them, right? And there'll be some who'll be called the least because they didn't keep the commandments and they taught others not to keep them. You know what yeah. I mean? It doesn't I, mean they I, didn't I, have faith. I can understand that interpretation of Matthew five nineteen. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I get that. I, I, I see that interpretation, yes. And this is and this is where I go with that, is the idea that if you have someone that's brand new to the faith, and this actually applies to the concept of, you know, whether we're using Yeshua or Jesus at the same way, right? Sure. Say, say, you know, in 1997, when I first gave my heart to Christ, first, first decided, you know what, I'm going to do this. I want to do this. Um, help me do this, Father, right? Help me do this, God. How do I do this? Started reading the Bible. I believe Jesus is your son that you sent to die for me. To You know, I had no clue how to really explain it. I just knew the, the core concepts. Yeah. And I called on the name of Jesus yeah. to confess the name of Jesus and didn't have a clue about right. the commandments. Right. Right. I just knew I wanted to, quote unquote, do what was right. I wanted to please God. That's all I knew. And yeah. that's and that's the general consensus I see from a lot of people that come into the faith. And they don't know the details yet because they're still babes in the faith. Yeah. And, yeah. and therefore, if I'd have died that day while after I said that prayer and was suddenly starting to read the Bible, Three hours later, had our family gotten in a car wreck and I'd have died, but I've been saved. Mm, yeah. See what I mean? So it's like I didn't know the name of Yeshua. I didn't right. know, you know, any any didn't know of, anything. anything. Didn't know anything. I tell people something similar with the criminal on the torture stake beside Christ, beside the Messiah. Um, obviously, he was up there justly. He had committed crime. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he must have had a heart change because Yeshua basically told him, you'll be in the kingdom. You know, uh, I, I truly I, I say unto you today, you'll be with me in paradise. So I bring this up because the criminal did not have an opportunity to make good um, on his crime with his works. He didn't have an op opportunity to climb down off of the cross and start to do the opposite of law breaking which is law keeping he, he couldn't do like zacchaeus where zacchaeus was still alive and when he was convicted he said oh i'll give half my goods to the poor and if i've taken anything i restore it back fourfold um and yeshua said salvation has come to your house today you know for you too are a son of abraham but the criminal on the cross didn't have that opportunity will he be in the kingdom why well, sure sure he'll be in the kingdom you know so i don't think I agree with you, Sean. I agree with you. Let's, I love that example, Matthew. Let's even take it further. Let's look at it through the lens of the actual Torah, right? Which the Torah gave us an idea for commandment. And then if there's, if you mess up and you break that commandment, then you would need to go to a priest for a, yeah. a sacrifice for atonement, right? Yeah, yeah. So that guy on the cross, remember there's two thieves. One of the thieves was mocking Jesus. And the, the one that stood up for him, the one that spoke to Jesus uh, lovingly, in a sense, he said, um, he's up here. He said, "Why are you, you know, why are you speaking like that? Have you no fear of God? We're we're up here because we deserve what we've done, mm -hmm. but this man's innocent, right? And so, like you, like he just said, that thief on the cross, he acknowledged his guilt for something. We don't know his crime. He could have been caught right. stealing. Who, who knows? He could have been. Who knows? Um, but it, it gives you the sense that he was he committed a crime. He was arrested, and now he's being punished with capital punishment for that crime, and never had the chance." to go to the temple and offer sacrifice for atonement for his crime. Right. Yeah. So it's like, it's even, it just deepens into this idea of his, the father's mercy exemplified through his son, whom he appointed as the judge as John chapter five tells us the one that he will judge and to, to whether he's going to call our names at the resurrection or not. Right. It's up to Jesus. It's up to Yeshua to judge us, not, not us to judge our fellow man. Right. And as far as our eternal destination. Right. Sure. sure. Um, and so there, I mean, obviously we make judgments on all other sorts of things, but that's, that's a little different context. But in this moment on the cross, this thief is sitting here. He, as far as we can tell, he admits he's guilty for why he's being killed, but he didn't go to the temple and make atonement with a priest for it. Didn't matter to, to Yeshua. He was no. just like, he could see the heart, yeah. you know, and this, this is what it reminds me of in Deuteronomy eight, chapter two, where Yahweh is telling Moses and the children of Israel, see, I brought you out in the wilderness these 40 years to test you, to see if it's in your heart to keep my commands. Mm, mm, mm. And it makes me wonder if that's the same guideline that Yeshua judges us by. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's beautiful, so, brother. I like it that. Just something to think about. Um, 
so yeah, I think you did a great job answering that. You know, the, the concept of obedience is the same, whether they were 3,000 years ago coming out of the Exodus with Moses, whether it was 4,000 years ago uh, before the flood, you know, in the, in the days of Noah, or whether it was um, in our, you know, 10 years ago, right? Sure. As, as we're dealing with bad pop music in the U.S. So. <laughs> Do you believe that he kept the law that we call the law of God, that some people call the law of Moses, and that he taught us to do the same? Yeah, absolutely. You, you mentioned Matthew 5, 17 through 19, and that comes right on the heels of a popular verse in modern Christianity about salt and light. Um, Matthew 5, 14 through 16, ye are the salt of the earth, okay? Ye are the light of the world. So it's in that context that he says, do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. The word fulfill is used in that context, not in the sense of I came to fulfill a prophecy or I came to bring something to an end. It's I came to teach this. I came to practice this. I came to do this. And that's why the conclusion is 19. Therefore, whosoever of you breaks even the least of these commandments and teaches people to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, which you quoted earlier. Yeah. So, yes, um, I, if I remember your question correctly, uh, Yeshua observed the commandments of Yahweh and he taught others to observe the commandments of Yahweh. I think that was a huge uh, message of his um, that, you know, that was that was a big message of his. I, I think that I think it goes along with the gospel of the kingdom when he says, you know, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He comes to preach the good news about the kingdom. That's the king. He's the king and and the dominion, which includes the law. So, yes, the short answer is yes, I, I believe what you said. <laughs> yeah, there, and that's something that um, I there's a little short passage in Luke chapter 10 that I just love. It's it's three, three verses, 25 to 28. And it's where uh, one of the um, the lawyer, you know, I know some translations may say it different, but. Um, the lawyer stood up and put him to the test and he said, teacher, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Yeah. And Yeshua responds back to him and says, what's written in the law? Yeah. I just read to you. Right. Yeah. So yeah. if I ever needed a proof text that directly told me. Yes. Jesus, someone asked Jesus, how do I get eternal life? Which yeah. you and I would both agree is one of the definitions of salvation, right? Sure. Sure. That's that's kind of the big guy. John three sixteen, right? Sure. Yes. God says his only begotten son. So who sure believes should not perish, but have everlasting life to have eternal life. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the promise that we, we strive for. The blessed hope, as Paul refers to it. But Jesus responds to him. He doesn't say you got to keep the law of Moses. Right. Right. He doesn't say now he's going to later, but I'm going to get there. <laughs> he, he says um, he says what's in the, written in the law. How do you read it? So he doesn't say what does Paul say? Right. Right. right? Paul wasn't even on the scene at the time. <laughs> right. Or if he was, he was a kid in the background, right? Yeah. Under under yeah. the wing of Gamaliel, yeah. uh, whatever his there name was, being the Pharisees. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so like he this this lawyer, meaning this is a guy who's supposed to know the law. Sure. So this is Jesus just handing it right back to him. Well, you you're a lawyer. Do you tell me? Yeah. You you're supposed to know the law, so tell me. Um, what's interesting though is he says, "How does it read to you?" And then the, the lawyer answers him back with, you know, some famous passage. We know you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind mm -hmm. and your neighbor as yourself, which basically he's just quoting from Deuteronomy 5 and Leviticus 19. Yes. A, lot of, a lot of modern believers don't seem to under, they don't realize that they haven't taken the time to look that up. Yeah. But Jesus then says back to him, you have answered correctly. Do yes. this and you will live. Yes. He says, you answer correctly, do this and you'll live. To me, it's it's there's no reinterpretation. There's, it's very hard to reinterpret this conversation here. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to wiggle away from this idea that how do I inherit eternal life? Yeah. Now, does this mean that if I do these things that were given in the quote unquote law of God from Deuteronomy 5 and Leviticus 19, these things that the lawyer said that Jesus says was correct to do these and I will live. Does this mean that just by doing those, then I've, then I get eternal life, right? To me personally, Matthew, this is where I think Ephesians 2.10 comes in. This is where I think this concept of what we, we cannot literally save ourselves, mm -hmm. right? We can be obedient to the Father, right? He who endures to the end will be saved. 
We can be obedient to the commands. But only Yeshua has the power to resurrect us on the day of the Lord. Only he has the power to raise our souls and give us new incorruptible bodies. Yeah. Only through his grace and his strength can he actually perform the duties of his priesthood perfectly without fail and perfect obedience as is destined for him and as is capable for him in order to have the authority to raise us up into eternal life. Yeah. So the, basically all Yeshua is telling him is like, yeah, these are the qualifiers. Do these and you'll live. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. But, I agree. Part of the not, part of the law is is um Deuteronomy 18. A prophet like unto me will Yahweh raise up. If you don't listen to him, you'll be destroyed. Acts chapter 3, Peter says, Yeshua of Nazareth is the prophet that Moses was talking about. You need to listen to him, guys, or you'll be destroyed. So believing in Yeshua is part of the Torah. That's right. So, I mean, when he says, you know, what's written in the law, that's part of it. Devarim, Deuteronomy 18 is, is part of it. So, and then, of course, you have messianic prophecy, you know, in Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53. So um, it's it's all it's definitely all encompassing. Um, we we need our our sins atoned for in the heavenly realm, in the heavenly tabernacle. Um, that's something that the animal sacrifices were never instituted, were never given to do in the first place. That's something that Yeshua does. So. So, yeah, I mean, it's all it's all encompassing. I agree. I think that's beautiful what you brought out there in Luke chapter 10. Um, it goes along. I don't I don't not sure if it's the exact same account, but it goes along with the account. Maybe it was the rich young ruler where he said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Yeshua said, keep the commandments. Yeah, it's the same concept. He's just always pointing back to these instructions from Yahweh, which is what we would call the law of God, which is where this idea of the Torah, this word Torah comes from. And that's what he's saying. This is the qualifier. This is your standard of obedience, right? This is sure. this is how you know you're my disciple, sure. is that if you're actually doing these behaviors, which Jesus himself did. Amen. Right? So I would never pretend to be a disciple of someone and not emulate their behavior. Yes, exactly. Disciple means what? Student, pupil. That's right. Yeshua says it's somewhere in the Gospel of Luke. Every disciple or pupil after he is trained will be like his teacher. And so if we claim that our, our rabbi or our teacher or instructor is Yeshua of Nazareth, we we should be being conformed to the to his image, as Romans 8 talks about. <laughs> we should be conformed to the image of the son. Um I, all my life, I grew up as a little boy. We would sing this song. You may have seen it in Assemblies of God kind of churches. But to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, that's all I ask is to be like him. Okay, so we sang that. And then I grew up and I started trying to be like him. I started trying to do what he did. Not not perfectly. I was I was kind of like the little boy. You know, when when your son was little, he probably did it where he, he follows you and he tries to put his feet in your footprints, and it looks awkward because he's little and you're big. You know, I've got so a probably, really got a picture of that where he's trying to get into my shoes. Yeah, so yeah. he's trying, he's trying to be like his dad, even though it looks awkward. And so I was trying to be like my big brother, my elder brother Yeshua of Nazareth, and it might have looked awkward. As I've grown in grace and in knowledge. I think that's gotten a little bit better. I still don't look exactly like Yeshua, but I'm trying. But when I started trying to be like Yeshua, that song that we had been singing to be like Jesus, all of a sudden they kind of wanted it wiped off the map because, oh, have you have you heard what Matthew Jansen is doing lately? You know, he's trying to keep this commandments and everything. And I thought, what about to be like Jesus? What about the song that we sang growing up? You know, <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually really ironic, you know, because I, I've 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 said your same conversation with other people, just slightly different words, and uh -huh. it's really ironic that what do we pray? You know, Father, make me like your Son, make me in the image of your Son, make me, you know, uh, give me give me the purity of the heart of Jesus, right, of the heart of Yeshua, help me to have that type of strength to obey you, to walk in your will, right? Show me your will, Father. This is what we've prayed for years. Yes. Is it possible that he's doing that? Yes, I believe so, Sean. I, he's I, I he's think answering that prayer, that corporate prayer that people go to prayer meetings. I've been at those prayer meetings that they're sitting there for weeping for two hours, you know, yeah. and they're praying for more of Jesus. And, and here it is this whole time in front of us where he's <laughs> like, yeah, I'll give you more. I just need you to take these words seriously. Yes, you know? I agree. I agree, brother. I agree.
And so on that note, this is something that this is my last question, brother, and then we'll we'll end this. Um, I really okay. appreciate you joining me. This has been no really problem. good. And, um, you know, in John 15, he reminds his disciples, you know, that he tells them that slave is no greater than his master. If right. they persecute me, they'll persecute you. Right. And, and of course, why, as we've established throughout this conversation, they persecuted him because he wasn't, as he explained to his disciples, he wasn't trying to set up a government at that time. Right. So he, he was no physical, political or uh, geopolitical threat to the Romans. Right. Or, or even to King Herod. Right. Yeah. Um, he exemplified his power with the Roman soldiers that came to, to, to nab him at, at Gethsemane. Right. They all fell down and just by him talking. Right. No one. He laid down his own life as he exemplifies. I also love that place. I think it's in Luke chapter four when he, he speaks the first time in his hometown in Nazareth. And they yeah. try to, the mob takes him out. To, <laughs> yeah. And then the next sentence is he just walked through the midst of them and left. And you're like, whoa, what happened? What happened there? <laughs> Talk about anticlimactic. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Like he just, he just exemplified power everywhere he went, right? Because yes. of the purity that flowed through him. I would yeah. personally attribute that power, that purity to his obedience to the commandments of God. Mm. Mm. We see that, that correlation all throughout scripture that those who are keeping the commandments, the father fights for them. The father protects them. The father, you know, does miraculous things for them. Those who are actually f trying to walk in the ways that he called righteousness sure. for us to, to practice and emulate. And he's telling his disciples who he's teaching these ways, by the way, they're going to persecute me. They're going to persecute you. Yeah. You know? So to me, this is a great qualifier, a great, um, a great sign, if you will, if I could put it like that, a great uh, signifier, maybe is a better way to put it uh, for to know, am I doing the behavior of Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. How much persecution am I getting? You know, yeah, so yeah. I don't know. And I say that a little tongue in cheek because I realize that in our modern society, there is a lot of believers around us. We live in a very blessed, blessed country where we yeah. have freedom of religion and, and freedom of, of assembly, of fellowship of religious uh, you know, in, in institutions, of church buildings. We can get together with like minded believers in the same room. So we're not going to really face persecution all the time. We go back to our house and, you know. We may not, you know what I'm saying? It's not exactly the same scenario, but at the, at the same time, we, most of us have run into scenarios and circumstances in our life with others, even in this country, where we have a moment to either speak our faith and de declare our faith and face persecution, whether even, even at the most basic level of just social shaming, right? Where someone just looks at you with a cross glance thinking, oh, you're one of those believers, huh? You're one of those Christians, those born again people. You know what I mean? So no matter what level of persecution it is, granted, we're not at the level the disciples were, where they're being drugged and quartered by horses or crucified upside down. But we are, we, that may happen in the future, uh, by the way. But at the same time, where we are in this culture and society now, we haven't faced a lot of persecution. But what I've seen, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I've seen a core, a one-to-one -one correlation throughout history of ruling governments who are against Yahweh and his instructions called the law of God, called the Torah, and anyone who tries to keep those, and that they have persecuted those people that try to keep those, which is exactly what Yeshua said in Matthew 23 to the Pharisees, that you guys sit in the seat of Moses— and you, you you read the words of Moses, but you don't actually do them. Yeah. And so then they, of course, overimposed their own traditions. And, they, and then, of course, they didn't like what he had to say and because <laughs> he was constantly putting them in their place. So they killed him. Right. Yes. Yes. And these people were under the authority of Rome. These people were in this leadership position under Herod, under the governor, Pilate, under the emperor at the time, under the authority of Rome, just at a small micro level in their specific region. And this is why they impose themselves not in a political slash, you know, uh, religious leadership role through the Sanhedrin. Right. And this is this, uh, this whole concept here is that they were the ones doing the persecuting, which of course we know we see later with the story of Paul right before his conversion, right? That he was a part of this kind of brute squad that was sent out to go round up Christians. I don't know if they're kicking in doors and pulling people out of their house, but it sure looked, it sounded like it. Right. And then they would stone them. They would because they considered them to be heretics for following Yeshua, and all Yeshua was doing was keeping these commandments. So I think it's fascinating that you know. Do you know of any just off the top of your head? Do you know of any like places in history in the last three, four thousand years of any government that you you think about that may have persecuted people for keeping the commandments? Uh, well, my mind. I mean, 
my mind immediately goes to the book of Daniel. And I'm not sure if you're talking about extra biblical history, but I think about Daniel, you know, praying when he was told not to. I think about the three Hebrews not bowing when they were told to bow down. And all of that was in obedience to the Torah. They they set Yahweh as top mighty one, um, even though they were subject to some extent to the authority on the earth. Yahweh was still top mighty one. So um, I've experienced persecution, Sean, uh, not 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 anything to the level of, you know, being uh, beaten or anything. But Yeshua does say in the Sermon on the Mount that people will speak evil of you and say things falsely about you. And I mean, there, there have been people that, um, and I don't, I don't want to go into it in detail because, you know, my, my desire is for, um, my persecutors to, to see the light. But I mean, there's been people I've done nothing but good for and man, I mean, just drag your name through the mud and then somebody, you know, meet me that, that didn't know me. And, uh, it's it's just it's it's tough. It's tough when you have friends or family, yeah, that that say that speak bad things about you, and, and you would uh, get that behavior towards you directly because you you started to realize and speak about and try in your personal walk with with Yeshua to keep the commandments. That was the whole reason. That's the whole reason. You know, they and they automatically think you know, well, he's trying to be better than thou, or he's a legalist and he thinks he's you know better than everybody else and. And um, Did you that know, has nothing to do with it, you know. <laughs> I read the most fascinating thing recently out of the uh, the apocryphal book, The Wisdom of Solomon, and it is that exact thing you just said mm. that those who follow God and His and His law, mm. those who do not, and those who refuse the authority of God, will look at those who follow God and say they think they're better than us. Wow. Do you have that? Do you have that? I'll, citation? Send it, I'll send it to you afterwards. I think it's in chapter 15 or 17. I can't remember off the top of my head, yeah. but it's it's several verses of like a conversation from people that have a, a bad disposition, a bad yeah. heart that are unbelievers and how they view believers. And it's yeah. what you've heard all of our life. I get that from people that you know are atheists or agnostics or you know, not believers. I, I remember uh, experiencing a lot of that in college where, you know, I, I would try to talk to people about my faith and they were like, you know, oh, you think you're better than us. In fact, you know, one time I went, I was a freshman in college. I went to a college party. Right. And there was people there drinking and doing it. And I walked in and they all knew that I was the Christian. <laughs> right. And so they all looked at me like, and the, and the person I walked in with, like, why did you bring Sean here? Like, this is yeah. what, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> he's just going to judge us, you know? Like, yes. Yes. You know, just, these sensitivities, just there, you could just see the hair on their arms standing up. And so I, you know, I just hung around, made a little conversation. And then I told my friend this, you know, I don't think that I'm well received here and this is not really the place for me. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and go. As I go to the door out, as I leave outside the door, there's these two guys standing there and one of them says, Hey, let me ask you a question for you go. And I'm like, okay, here it comes. Here comes the troll, right? The trolling questions, you know, the antagonism. Yeah. Um, he said, what do you think about organized religion? And I just said, I, I don't think it's in the Bible. I think that, that it not, at least not the way the Catholic Church presents it. Uh -huh. And this guy goes, what? And he said, I thought you were a Christian. I was like, well, let's, let's actually go off what the Bible says and not what the Catholic Church says. And that led to a three-hour conversation. Wow. Where we went back into the apartment, but back to one of the back bedrooms, multiple people were there listening as I'm just going over the scriptures with them. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons for that's just a little small experience in my life of, of trying to overcome persecution in, in the face of it. Now, in the in the group of people listening during that, there was other people that were still actively speaking hate against me during that conversation. And I was just ignoring them and continuing to talk with the guys that were interested to talk with to the point where. One of the main guys who I was talking with, you know, he's tearing up. You know what I mean? The father's working on his heart, you know? Mm. And all I'm doing is just trying to explain the scriptures to him the best I knew how. I was only like a year and a half old in the word at that time, right? So I had no clue what I was talking about. It had to be the spirit working through me. But ultimately, what I realized quickly was it's nothing but misconceptions out there. There's yes. a ton of people out there. They have questions. They didn't get them answered at their churches for whatever reason. They either left the church or they just stayed quiet and they just got tons of misconceptions and this mm -hmm. is this is my passion this is my goal to bring clarity 
um, because I believe 100% that when we actually start defining things from Scripture, it's easy to understand. It brings an incredible amount of joy and inspiration and hope. You can, you you do, you know, quickly go through some of these objections um, mm-hmm. and find clarity for them um, because we just start letting the word define itself instead of our own preconceived ideas. And so that's my heart for everyone watching this interview I've had here with Matthew and and the subsequent, you know, videos that are that are in this episode that, um, you know, I I believe in a father who loves us so much yeah. that when he created us, he gave us a way to live life in love and peace. And he offered those those instructions to us on how to do that. And consequently, in the Hebrew language, those words are called Torah. Yeah. And so this is the ones I want to put in my heart that I might not sin against him. Amen. Amen. um, Matthew, thank you for joining me. This has been a real pleasure, brother. Hey, I've I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. Um, I, I had opened my Bible to Matthew 5 and... I have to constantly remind myself when we're going through all of that stuff with other people and it hurts. I'm an emotional person. Okay. So it hurts when people close to you spread rumors and say false things. But Yeshua said, you're blessed and rejoice. And I'm thinking, what? Rejoice. (laughs) Luke's gospel, he says, leap for joy. You know, so I tell people I still have a little Pentecostal in me. I believe in those verses that talk about leap. But he says, leap for joy because they persecuted the prophets who have been before you in this same way. That's right. So that's that's what we have to keep in mind, that um, just because people accuse us of things, just like they accused Yeshua of things that he wasn't guilty of, people accuse us of certain things. We're blessed. Rejoice. Love your enemies. Give water to people that hate you. Give food to those that curse you. <laughs> and, uh, and it, you know, we'll, we'll be OK. And. We got it. We got to really we got to take it. We got to take it because one day it could get a lot worse and we could be like Brother Stephen in Act seven where they they threw rocks at him and they murdered him. Uh, So and and he was standing for the law. He was standing for the law. He told he told the people there. He said, you you received the law by the disposition of angels, but you have not kept it. (laughs) Absolutely. So he was the one standing for the law and they they. They gnashed on him with their teeth and stopped their ears. And, and Saul of Tarsus was there holding the coats of those that stoned Stephen. So, you know, there's there's some persecution right there. So one day that could happen to, to people like me and you, uh, Sean. And hopefully we'll be able to um, to stand firm and not give in. And yeah. to the end. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the prayer, right? Is that and, and to me, that's what the importance of all this is, is understanding his word, you know, as it's given to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and clarity and context, because that is what builds that type of faith that we see these epistle writers, these apostles of, of Yeshua have. Yes. And all the men of that generation who would gladly, gladly be killed for, for faith and, and profession, not just of Yeshua and his life, death and resurrection, but of the concept of a creator who loves us, gave us divine instruction for behavior and living. He's got a kingdom coming in the future yeah. that we're all going to be doing that instruction, whether you understand it now or not. Sure. Isaiah 2, 2 through 5, the law will go forth from Zion. Yes. And, then, and everyone will be doing it whether inside and outside the city. So it's it's a wonderful promise for us. Yeah. And uh, I just, and to me, that is the kind of faith building clarity that will bring us that kind of strength through persecution so that we can count it all joy. Amen. So, anyway, I'm, Thank you so much for joining us. And um, this has been a great interview, brother. I hope to have you back another time. Be glad to. Be glad to.